Okay, so this is the second lesson of my short course with uh, an introduction to satellite antennas or antennas for spaceborne applications. In this uh, uh, second lesson, uh, I will uh, cover uh, in more details, having uh, discussed uh, some fundamental concepts about antennas in general. We, uh, I remind you that we touched upon uh, directivity, the definition of dire directive gain and directivity. We spoke about uh, half power beam widths, we spoke about uh, a gain as uh, different uh, from, from directivity to some extent. Uh, we defined the patterns of an antenna. Now we would like to get into the actual application of antennas, specifically to satellite systems, and we'll also give some definitions, some basic configurations of antennas for satellite applications. So in uh, the outline, I summarize the lesson, I will speak about the satellite antenna footprints, satellite orbits, because somehow the footprints depends on the satellite orbits, in particular there is one important orbit for many satellite applications, is the geostationary orbit and constellation. We will describe the different type of antennas depending on the type of coverage you want to obtain, a global coverage antennas, elliptic coverage antennas, or spot or multi-beam type of antennas and also the so-called the contoured coverage antennas or shaped beam antennas. We will uh, just touch upon uh, the beamforming networks which are the networks needed for uh, getting this contoured type of, of antennas and we will uh, introduce a very fundamental uh, configuration for the light application that is the parabolic reflector antennas in different type of architectures. At the end, we will speak also about the phase array antennas and active array antennas that were uh, just introduced in the previous lesson as uh, a, an example of antennas where the reciprocity uh, principle does not apply. So let's speak about the satellite antenna footprint. In the slide, you can see a satellite is not defined the orbit and this satellite is radiating through its antenna and you can imagine the, the main pa the pattern of the antenna that is somehow illuminating one part of the Earth and this part of the Earth that is illuminated by the main beam of the antenna with, uh, and you can define a minimum gain uh, uh, by which the area is, is uh, illuminated is in fact called the footprint, antenna footprint, satellite antenna footprint. So in a satellite antenna footprint, in this slide is the example of a geostationary satellite. In particular, you see from the slide is uh, the hot bird, uh, is a family hot, hot bird satellites, which are Udelsat satellites. It's a very famous, uh, used by many people to receive uh, TV programs uh, through satellite antennas. So this uh, is uh, the footprint of a specific, satellite, specific family of satellites from geostationary orbit, but in general we can define, the, given uh, the antenna footprint, uh, the so-called isogain contour lines uh, or lines. We, what are they? They are the locus of the places over the Earth where the gain of the antenna is the same. So we said that the isogain contours uh, define areas where the satellite antenna is illuminating the Earth with the, the same uh, directivity or gain. Uh, from the user point of view, and especially in case of a satellite for TV broadcasting, these contours uh, over uh, the Earth are expressed in terms of uh, EIRP, that is the effective isotropic radiated power, uh, it's, a, it's a value in dB watts, uh, or even uh, in the corresponding needed diameter of the ground antenna that is uh, necessary for a uh, user to receive the signal, uh, the TB signal, in, uh, with a good uh, signal over, over noise ratio. So in this case you see that both values are given. So you see for instance that uh, this type of antennas wanted to serve, uh, let's say, to illuminate uh, at best uh, the European uh, area and in fact over this area you can effectively get a good value of a very high value of EIRP and conversely you can use a rather small uh, reflector antenna on ground to receive the signal. So this gives an idea again of how good 
the antenna is on board and how good is the satellite illuminating the uh, coverage area over the uh, Earth or the required coverage area. Of course, uh, the, uh, while the pattern of an antenna is the same and it doesn't depend on the orbit, the intersection of this pattern with the Earth in terms of uh, uh, angular values, uh, let's say the area expressed in terms of angles, uh, depends on the, on the satellite orbit. The farther away from the Earth the satellite is and the smaller is the equivalent area in degrees uh, of the pattern intersecting the Earth. So it is important then to consider the, the satellite orbit to understand what is the uh, coverage over the Earth expressed in degrees. In fact, we, have to, we should obtain maps of the Earth from different orbits and they will uh, correspond to the different uh, angular spacing in degrees. There are several orbits for satellites, as you probably already know. Uh, one important orbit, which I already mentioned, is the geostationary orbit, where satellites are usually in a plane that is the same as the equatorial plane, and they fly around the Earth at approximately an altitude of 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. But there are then also low Earth orbits, uh, where satellites are much closer to the Earth, in a range um, between 500 and 2,000 kilometers in altitude. There are medium Earth orbits that are in between uh, the LEO uh, orbits and the gestationary orbits, uh, and uh, there are several applications for MEO orbits. For instance, the navigation satellites like GPS or Galileo are in, uh, in MEO orbits, medium Earth orbits. There are also the so-called highly uh, elliptic uh, orbits, uh, HEO, which are characterized by the fact that the, the orbit itself is very elliptic, elliptic. Remember that all orbits are elliptic in the, by definition because uh, as uh, they follow the Kepler laws, and the Kepler laws say that the orbits are elliptic, but uh, the circular orbits are just a special case of elliptic orbits. So geostationary orbits are basically uh, circular, while the uh, highly elliptic orbits are normal, I would say, elliptic orbits, uh, characterized by a perigee, that is the closest uh, point of the orbit to the Earth, that is maybe around 500 kilometers, while the apogees are much higher, in the order of uh, 50,000 kilometers or more. And this type of orbits uh, have been used to illuminate, to cover, well, uh, the areas of the Earth that are close to the poles, and so for instance in this uh, class of orbits uh, belong uh, orbits uh, developed by Russians, uh, such as the Molnia and the, and the Tundra type of orbits. So depending on the orbit, you will have uh, the same antenna, will have a, a different coverage in terms of degrees over the Earth. Let's look at the geostationary orbit, which is very important. The geostationary orbit, as we said, is a circular orbit. The radius of the orbit is in the order of 36,000 kilometers, counted from the surface of the Earth. So, in fact, from the center of the Earth is around 42,000 kilometers. You have to add the radius of the Earth. What is, and what is the characteristic of the orbit? It is a very unique orbit. At that uh, distance from the surface of the Earth, the uh, period of uh, rotation of the satellite around the Earth is 24 hours. So, which means that the satellites uh, move around the Earth, but also the Earth rotates in the same direction. The end result is that from a user on ground, it looks as if the satellite is, uh, is not moving. He will always see the satellite above his head in the same direction. And this is very good for uh, TV broadcasting, for instance, for all communications where you want to point a certain satellite and don't move, and you don't want to track the satellites and move the ground antenna to follow the satellites. All the antennas we use for the TV reception, for satellite TV broadcasting, are fixed. I mean, they are not following the satellite. This thanks to the geostationary orbit. Now, the ge Geostationary orbit is a, a very important invention. It was never patented, and the uh, inventor 
regretted not having patented this invention and uh, maybe not uh, many people uh, remember that the geostationary orbit was actually invented by Arthur Clarke. Arthur Clarke is a famous uh, science fiction uh, writer, he is uh, the author of many famous novels, science fiction novels, one is uh, very famous also because uh, is linked to one of the best, probably the best movie, science fiction movie ever filmed so far, that is 2001 uh, A Space Odyssey, uh, that was directed by another genius, uh, Stanley Kubrick. And uh, this uh, Arthur Clarke uh, wrote a paper in 1945, so many years before uh, the first satellite in 1957, the first Sputnik 1, and he was uh, in fact proposing uh, a geostationary orbit to just to allow satellite communication. So he was anticipating satellite communications where satellites had not been yet realized. And uh, he was explaining that through the geostationary orbit and three satellites, a minimum of three satellites, uh, equally spaced around the geostationary uh, circle around the Earth, it was possible, in fact, to cover practically the whole of the Earth uh, with the fixed satellites, satellites that were not moving as uh, with respect to the Earth's surface, uh, and so allowing uh, satellite communications all over the globe. So it's a very important uh, uh, invention, a very important constellation, in fact, used a lot. So this is uh, uh, taken as, an, as a first example to understand the concept of coverage of, from a geostationary orbit. So the first thing we could uh, uh, want to realize is a global coverage uh, from a geostationary orbit. So we want to cover as much as possible of the Earth, having our satellite, as we said, at approximately 36,000 kilometers uh, above the Earth's surface. So we see the geometry of the, the link, if you want. The Earth is seen, the full Earth, almost it, because you see that it cannot reach really the north and southern pole, but uh, the most of the Earth is seen from a geostationary satellite, from the geostationary orbit, uh, under an angle of, uh, total angle of approximately uh, 18, as a matter of fact, it's a bit less, 17.5 degrees, okay? So, if we want to cover that area, virtually possible area, with an antenna, we know by now, after the first lesson, that we will need a beam width uh, of the same value. So in the first approximation, we should think of an antenna that has a beam width of approximately 18 and 17.5 degrees. And this is what uh, we see in the following slide, in the present slide, we see exactly the dimensioning of a global coverage antenna. This is the simplest antenna we can think of. It's still very much used in many applications, even for uh, for satellite communication is uh, uh, the antenna that realizes the maximum coverage over the Earth. We'll see that, in fact, we see here only the, uh, the coverage in uh, elevation, in the elevation, let's say, north-south uh, elevation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the same we should look, and we'll look at it in a minute, uh, in, in azimuth. Uh, we said that we need three satellites, in fact, to cover the complete Earth, but in terms of uh, beam width, we can take a circular aperture, so it will be a completely symmetric type of beam width. We see it over one plane. Uh, the beam width, theta uh, subscript 3 dB, the half power beam width, we said it should be around 18 degrees, 17.5 to be very precise. So now, uh, after the first lesson, we have the tools to dimension, let's say, to know what is the realizable gain from the antenna. Uh, we know, we remember that we want to, the formula to get the half power beam width uh, as a function of the uh, lambda, the frequency of operation, uh, so the wavelength of the antenna, and the linear dimension of the antenna. In this case, is, uh, we consider a circular aperture, so the linear dimension is the diameter of the, of the antenna itself. Uh, we can uh, derive the gain from with the same formula with a little simple transformation. We can consider an, an, an overall efficiency, including ohmic and radiator loss, or let's say of 50%, 55%, which is a good and reasonable value. What we get, we get if we consider a frequency of operation at 4 gigahertz, 
is a, a maximum obtainable gain in this uh, geometry of the orbit over 20 dBs, uh, which corresponds to a diameter of a circular aperture of 0.3 meters. So this would be a, what we call a, a horn antenna. It's a very simple feed. It doesn't even need a reflector, in fact, it's a very small. With such a small feed, in fact, we can cover the uh, complete one third, let's say, of the complete area uh, surface of the Earth and get a 20 dB gain, which is not a negligible, a negligible gain. Of course, we, as we said, we need the three satellites to cover most of the Earth. This is an example of Inmarsat satellites. Constellation of uh, geostationary satellites are still very common. Uh, they are used by Inmarsat. Inmarsat is uh, an international uh, company, an organization that is uh, devoted mainly to maritime type of communications, but uh, other type of um, organization and companies uh, such as Udelsat, for instance, or SES Astra, are also uh, basing your, their business on uh, geostationary satellites and they have uh, somehow the same type of coverage. We'll see that they have improved their coverage, but the basic coverage, uh, if you really want to reach all places, in case of Wimmers, that even the sea areas are important because they are devoted to maritime communications, then you need uh, to cover with the three global coverages. And these are three global coverage over the Earth. The antenna that is producing this uh, uh, the, the three individual beams is uh, very similar to the antenna we saw before. Uh, before. There, is an there was an evolution, of course, from the very simple antenna realizing a global coverage that is uh, shown in this picture uh, on, the, uh, on the left side. Uh, we wanted to get a better, higher gain. To get a higher gain, we know now the trick. The, gain, the antennas are not producing uh, energy, they are just concentrating energy, so if I want to get a higher gain, I have to reduce the area, the illuminated area, so if uh, I get 20 dB gain with a global coverage antenna and I want to increase it, what I can think of is to uh, divide the global coverage into two, so I have two so-called Amy coverages, which means half coverages of the Earth, and there I gain some approximately 3 dBs because I have halved the area to be illuminated, or I can think of uh, rather large spots shown in the third picture in the slide, uh, or even smaller spots, so I can get smaller and smaller spots. The smaller the spot, the higher is the gain. Uh, there are many complications in producing uh, small spots, uh, there are complications also from the system point of view in dealing with uh, a multi-spot coverage, but what is the result? In the bottom of the slide we see the effect is that with a, a large beam that is covering all of the Earth, uh, I need very large antennas because the gain of my uh, satellite antenna is not that high, so I, my received signal will not be so good, and I need the large uh, reflectors, the large antennas on ground to receive the signal. The smaller the area, the coverage area, so the smaller the beam width I can realize, and the smaller and smaller becomes the size of the user terminal. So much so that when I get a very sophisticated multi-spot antennas with spot beams very small realized over the earth, I can in fact even use very simple user receivers with very small antennas that are portable. There are communications today through satellites uh, where I can use uh, something that is very equivalent to a smartphone with a very small uh, whip antennas. This is uh, achievable because of the gain I have realized uh, in, uh, from the satellite antenna and the trick again is very simple that I have to reduce the beam width uh, and this we'll see in a minute that means also increasing the size of the antenna antenna size flying today can reach very huge diameters, uh, even more than 10 meters uh, on board, uh, but the reduction and the simplification is on ground. So this is uh, the principle of uh, how to size the uh, coverage of an antenna to uh, fit into the system and communication requirements. 
So if I want to now to, uh, let's consider again, as a matter of example, a, a geostationary orbit, but it would not uh, uh, make it different if we consider a different orbit, I can uh, think of uh, a coverage uh, that, uh, of a certain area, in this case is the coverage of Europe uh, as seen from a geostationary satellite, uh, being uh, very simple, as simple as possible, it's not uh, global because I'm concentrating the energy over a specific area, uh, so it is somehow a spot beam, a very large spot beam, but it is very simple. Uh, it, it is what we call uh, it, uh, an elliptic coverage, so it's the ellipse being uh, the simplest uh, uh, shape I can uh, get from an antenna. Uh, circular or elliptic are very similar, it depends on the symmetry of the aperture on board that is creating the beam. So the elliptic coverage uh, is the, the simplest uh, coverage I can think of to illuminate uh, a certain area of the Earth uh, that I want to, to serve with my communication link. It can be generated on board by an elliptic aperture, ellipse being a general case for a spot beam or circular shape or elliptic shape. So in this case the elliptic shape fits rather well. I want to, the, the, my coverage, I want to cover the European area, so I think of an ellipse that is oriented in such a way to cover it at best. The ellipse gives me some degrees of freedom, of course, but not that much. And I see that this uh, coverage is not ideal. It fits well the coverage of the main part of Europe, but at the same time there is a lot of energy, I can notice, which is spread over the sea areas, the sea surface, and that is a wasted energy because I do not want to broadcast over the Mediterranean or over the North, uh, the North Sea. So there are better ways, let's say, to, uh, to cover a certain area than an elliptic beam. Ellipses are also fitting into other coverages. For instance, an, ellipse, an elliptical coverage fits well in covering the North America. So there were uh, some, many satellite missions that were, uh, in fact, uh, using el elliptical beams uh, to cover uh, the north, the United States of America. And we see here an example of uh, the coverage with the different uh, realized EIRPs, the effective isotropic radiated power uh, contour uh, uh, lines. If I want to further increase my, my gain, we said that I have to go for smaller and smaller uh, spot beams. And uh, here in this slide we see how the uh, spot beam coverage is realized. So I imagine I want to realize many such uh, spot beams uh, over the, to cover my, my area of service. Then I have to think of, uh, I introduced the concept of reflector antennas. We'll look at it uh, in more detail in a few minutes. But uh, let's say uh, in this case I have a reflector antenna which is fed by several uh, feeds uh, that are illuminating the antenna, each of the feed is creating one individual beam. So this is a way to generate a spot uh, beam coverage, a spot beam antenna. This type of uh, coverage is exists in practice, for instance, used for, for communications, you know, uh, even for TV broadcasting. When I want to serve uh, at the best uh, a, a country, a specific country, maybe also because uh, that coverage is uh, linked to a certain language. So imagine I want to broadcast uh, TV channels over Spain or over Italy or over France, I may want to limit my coverage to that area where, by the way, the same language is, is, uh, is used. And so in this case, I utilize uh, multi-beam coverages. Uh, I need uh, rather complex uh, antennas, uh, both on the reflector side, reflectors of uh, relatively large uh, sides, and also array of uh, feeds such that I can generate uh, these uh, different beams uh, over uh, the Earth. And, uh, but I can also uh, want to uh, realize uh, shaped beams, so I, not only smaller beams, but beams that also follow the best uh, the, uh, the shape of the area I want to serve. How can I get uh, these uh, shaped beams? Well, the very first uh, simple way to realize the shaping uh, is uh, to size uh, shape the reflector of the antenna itself, so the aperture of the antenna. The elliptical reflector is a very simple example of shaping 
of the, uh, of the beam, because through the elliptic uh, shape I get an ellipse, I can orient it, so it's very simple and not very effective, but still it's an example of shaving. An even better shaving I can get through the approach we saw before to use apertures, reflectors, that are fed by several feeds. Uh, what is the idea? The idea is shown in the slide is that instead of having one single beam which has got a certain roll off, so I cannot optimize the gain at the border of the area I want to cover, I can think of the combination of smaller individual beams that are added together in such a way that I can better shape, so I can better get uh, uniform uh, gain over the area I want to serve and then uh, a sharp roll off uh, over areas of the gain, over areas that I'm not interested in. The concept is maybe better expressed in the present slide. Be on the left side of the, of the slide, we see the previous, uh, previously shown multi-spot approach, so an aperture, a reflector, fed by individual feeds, each feed is carrying a different signal, so it is generating a different spot over the earth. On the right side, I still have an array of feeds, but now the feeds are fed by the same signal, only combined in the appropriate way by a BFN that stands for Beam Forming Network. We'll look at them later in the presentation. So the end result is now a combination of the previous beams. I, I have a beam that is, uh, is somehow the sum uh, of the previous spot beams, so I can cover a, a larger area. It's important the reflectors are the same size. In one case, I use the full size of the reflector to get several small beams. On, in, on the right side, I use a larger reflector to generate a wider beam, but with a much better shading. So uh, to get, I get a coverage that is larger than before, but with a better performance, better following the contours of the area I want to serve, at the expense of a, more, of a larger uh, aperture, I could have used a smaller aperture, but without any good shading, and uh, at the expense also of a more complex uh, feed network. So the same uh, uh, coverage I could, I could have got with a simpler antenna, but with the worse performance. So this is the principle of what do I get out of a shaded beam antenna, is a, a coverage similar to a previous slide, one slide that we saw before introducing the isogain uh, contours, uh, and you see uh, again is a coverage of Europe, you see here that uh, the shading of the beam achieved a very good uh, following of the areas that wanted to be served, here there is an attempt to limit the gain and so not to waste energy over, for instance, certain areas that are over the ocean, because the ocean is not uh, of interest. Here the gain is concentrated in, uh, over Europe, over the north of Africa, because it was part of, of the coverage, and somehow you see that there was a, a calculated approach to optimize the gain when it, where it was needed, directly where it was needed. So this is the principle of contour coverage.